Well, I do want to welcome all of you here and those of you that are watching online to Venia Church. Venia means grace, and here at Venia, we share the grace of God by loving people, because God accepts us as we are, and He sees the potential of who we can be. Amen? Amen. God's Word changes lives. So today we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 8, and I want to talk to you this morning about how relevant Jesus is. C.S. Lewis once stated, Christianity, if false, is of no importance, and if true, is of infinite importance. The one thing it cannot be is moderately important. Uh, When we look at what Christianity is, this idea that Jesus is God and that He came to this earth and lived a life as a human being, uh, fully God and fully human at the same time, uh, lived that life of perfection, died that death on that cross, rose again into glory, and you and I place our faith in Him, that He would be our Lord and Savior, and we have life everlasting as we're born again into His kingdom. That is the most relevant, the most important thing in our lives. It's the most important thing we can talk about. Humanity, no matter the demographic, it doesn't matter what age you are, what gender you are, what race you are, it doesn't matter what income bracket you belong to, it doesn't matter what geographic location you are in, all of humanity has the the same basic need for salvation. Let me give you a statistic. One out of every one people die. I don't know if you knew that or not, but specifically for our study here this morning, we need to know that. One out of every one people dies. Uh, And so that leads humanity to have a very important question. What happens after I die? Where am I going to go? Am I ever going to see my loved ones again? Uh, What happens to my body? Uh, Do I just go into the ground and rot, or is there a heaven and a hell? You know, so it, it begs these questions, and not only questions about what happens after death, uh, you know, the whole life eternal thing, but what happens now. This life that you and I live, it's full of joy and sorrow, pleasure and pain, hard work and rest. I mean, there's so much that goes into this life, and it begs the question, how do I get through this life properly and successfully? How can I live a life that means something and will leave a legacy behind. And when you take a look at these questions, the answer to these questions are more relevant than any other thing in our lives. And the answer to these questions is Jesus. He is the most relevant thing in our lives. Relevant meaning He is the most closely connected to or the most appropriate to the matter at hand. So when it comes to things like where will I go when I die? The, the most closely connected to that matter is Jesus. Think about versions or uh, scriptures of the Bible like John 3.16. One of the most popular version, you know, uh, scriptures in the Bible, we all know it. For God so loved the world, say it with me, that He gave His only begotten Son so that whoever would believe in Him would not perish, but have what? everlasting life, eternal life, that there's something that goes on beyond the grave. When we're thinking about life and death and the idea that these bodies are going to die and we're questioning what happens after that, there's nothing more relevant than Jesus. It's because of Jesus that we have that life everlasting. So Jesus is that most relevant piece. And same thing when it comes to not just death and you know, the whole life after death, but life here on earth. Jesus is the most appropriate, relevant thing to that matter. Psalm 46, 1-3 says, God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. So we will not fear when earthquakes come and the mountains crumble into the sea. Let the oceans roar and foam. Let the mountains tremble as the waters surge. My translation of that, bring it on. Doesn't matter what happens. If God is for me, who can be against me? God is on my side. Bring it on. Let it be. Let the, let the stuff happen. Let the oceans roar. Let the mountains tremble. It doesn't matter. God's on my side. 
Jesus is the most relevant God. He's the most relevant solution to all our problems. He's the most relevant person in our lives. And we're going to shed a little more light on that in this morning's message entitled, Why Jesus is Relevant. Remember, uh, as we, we're, we're continuing this study through the book of Hebrews, and it is written to first century Jewish believers. Uh, they'd become discouraged. Many of them started looking back to Judaism and uh, thinking, hey, maybe I'll, I'll go back to that. Um, and so they needed encouragement. And as you and I read it here in 2016, it can be an encouragement to us as well. And as we've gone through, we've been answering the question, why Jesus? I mean, you think about it, there's a lot of religious systems out there. There's a lot of self-help organizations. There's a lot of different ways of living life. Why Jesus? Well, we're going to see more of that this morning. Last week, we talked about why Jesus wants to remove intellectual roadblocks. We talked about a character named Melchizedek. And uh, this was an intellectual roadblock to these first century Jews moving forward in their understanding, moving forward in their walk with Jesus. And so they needed that roadblock removed so they could move forward. Uh, If you missed that, go to venia.tv forward slash sermons, and you can check that out. But for now, let's go ahead and get right into our text, which again is Hebrews chapter 8. We're going to pick up right in verse 1. Now there in verse 1, it says, now this is the main point. Let's pause there for just a moment. This is the main point. Uh, As we've gone through now chapters 1 through 7, what we found is the idea that Jesus is superior. He's superior to the prophets. He's superior to the priests. Um, In every way, we found Jesus is superior. And it continues to build this same thought of his superiority, superiority over and over and over again. And one of the things it brought in was that he is the great high priest. And we talked about the the role of a high priest bringing atonement for the sin of the nation and how Jesus has brought atonement for the world. So now what he's doing here in chapter 8, he says, okay, so we've done this entire buildup about the superiority of Jesus. And so this is the main point of it. He says this, we have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected, not man. So when it says true there, this is the true tabernacle that Jesus is at. It's true as a, not, not as opposed to false, but true as in original, as opposed to a copy. So it's, it's not a copy, it's, it's the original. Exodus chapter 25 Verses 8 and 9, God was talking about building the temple here on earth. He says, have the people of Israel build me a sanctuary so I can live among them. You must build this tabernacle and its furnishings exactly according to the pattern I will show you. If you ever get a chance to travel to Israel, and I highly, highly recommend it, um, if you get a chance to travel there, uh, as you get to certain uh, places where they sell stuff, which is all pretty much every stop you get to, uh, one of the main things you'll see that they sell is a little kit. And it's a kit that you can buy and build yourself a replica of the temple. And um, it, it looks really complicated to figure out. It says it's for kids, but I'm looking at it going, oh my gosh, that would take forever. Um, but you, know, you open up the box, and there's all these little teeny tiny pieces, and you fit it all together, and what you end up is a little replica, a little scaled model of the temple. Now, it's obviously not the real temple, but it's a neat little conversation piece. You could put it up in your office. You could put it on the coffee table. When people come over, you could discuss your trip to Israel and how you made this little temple replica and talk about where Jesus would have stood when he gave certain sermons. It's a neat little thing. But the fact and the point that I'm trying to get to is even though you may have built this little replica, when you compare that to the actual temple that was there that that Solomon built and that Herod rebuilt, and that the temple that we're talking about here is Herod's temple that was rebuilt. Um, that was the one that was there in this time. So that thing was huge. I mean, this was an archaeological masterpiece. People traveled from all over the world to see it. They, they couldn't wait to see this massive archaeological 
you know, build. I mean, it was, it was amazing. And so, yeah, we can go ahead and make a little tiny replica and put that in our house, but it's nothing. It's a toy. You know, it's, it's just nothing compared to the real deal. And I say this because what God's saying is, look, you're my children, and I want you to build a replica. I'm going to give you a pattern that I want you to make it out of. And it'd be the same thing as us today getting one of those little kits and telling the kids, okay, I want you to make a little replica. You know, the point that he's making in here is that this Jesus that you and I serve, he, he doesn't just, he's not there in this little man-made temple. He's not in a temple that, that human hands have made. He's in a temple that he made that's up in heaven. It's the real deal. It's the original temple. It's, it's the one that was modeled after that he told him, hey, I'm going to give you a pattern. I'm going to have you make it there on earth. I'm going to dwell in that in earth. But up in heaven, what's real up in heaven is amazing. Now, if we consider that, and you and I consider life eternal, we consider our life here on earth, we consider well, what are we going to put our trust in? Do we want to put our trust in what humankind can do? Or do we want to put it in the one who rules and reigns in the mighty temple built by the hands of God? I would submit to you that as we're considering who's going to speak into our lives and how we live it, I think God has given us something way more relevant in Jesus than any other thing here on earth. Amen? And so he's more relevant than anything. Not only is he more relevant because he rules from a superior temple, but notice in verse 3 that the scripture says that every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one, this one being Jesus, it's necessary that this one also have something to offer. For if he were here on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law. Verse 5, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. So what this is saying is, since Jesus is our great high priest, just like the high priests here on earth had to make a sacrifice. They had to give an offering. So Jesus would have to do the same. So we're going to get into chapter 9 uh, later on, but in, in chapter 9 we're going to really dig in deep about the sacrifice of Jesus. But for today, let me just submit a few things for you to consider as we, we ponder the sacrifice of Jesus. First of all, the sacrifice that Jesus offered was far superior to the sacrifice that human priests had to offer because human priests offered what? Animals? Animals, right? Okay. I heard a couple of people say animals. They offered animal sacrifices, and there were different levels of animal sacrifices, but they were animal sacrifices nonetheless. The sacrifice that Jesus offered was himself a human being. So he's like, look, I know that they're doing this, and this is according to what my father told them, but I'm going to sacrifice myself. I I'm going to put myself on the cross, and I'm going to allow myself to be that offering. And so his sacrifice was human instead of animal. Also, his sacrifice cost him everything. Think about the different animals that people would have to sacrifice, make atonement for their sins. Based on the level of sins, some of them were just you know, maybe two turtle doves, but then there was also bull, right? And so depending on where it was and what had taken place, this could be a very costly sacrifice, but it didn't cost everything. It only cost a portion of what you had because the other portion was still there for you to live your life. Jesus said, no, no, no. I'm going to take it a step further. I'm going to give everything. My entire life, I'm going to sacrifice. I'm going to give up my life. I'm going to give up being up in heaven. Because think about it. He gave up living in heaven to come down to earth. He stepped out of glory for a moment, walked on this earth, and suffered for us. That was his sacrifice. So again, we're going to talk about that more next week. But, but fin finally, as we look at this, his sacrifice was final. 
as opposed to perpetual. We talked about Yom Kippur, this day of atonement that would take place every single year, and the high priest you know, sacrificing a bull for the sin of himself and the household, and then the, the goat that he would sacrifice, and then the other one would get let go. How often did that take place? Every year. I mean, year after year, decade after decade, century after century, remember? This was going on and on and on. Jesus says, listen, my sacrifice is going to be human instead of animal. It's going to cost everything instead of a portion, and it's going to be final instead of every year. No, no more of this perpetual sacrificing. What I'm going to do is once and for all finished, far, far superior. And when we look at the issues of life and death, when we look at the issues of how are we going to live now, the person who gives the greater sacrifice becomes way more relevant to our lives. Now, every other God in this world, and I say God with a little g, a lowercase g, all these other gods in this world want something from you. Think about it. You know, Pastor Scott and I, we used to travel to this island called Bali. It's predominantly a Hindu island. And one of the things that we had to be cautious of is when we walked, we had to make sure we didn't step on someone's sacrifice. They literally, in the Hindu culture, they'd have these little baskets, and whatever they had with them, they would take out a portion of that, that for the day. So if they had a little bag of cookies, they'd take one cookie out and set it on this little, little altar made out of palm leaves. And if they were a smoker, they'd take one of their cigarettes out and put that in there. And if they had money in their pocket, they'd take a little bit out and they'd stick it in there. And they would put all this together, a little thing of incense, and if they're walking along, there were certain prescribed times in the day, they'd stop put that all together, they could be, and I'm not joking, quite literally, in the middle of the street. And they'd stop and put that sacrifice down. And the whole idea is they want to appease their God. They're fearful that if they don't stop and do that sacrifice, they're not going to gain favor with their God. This is all throughout the world. All these false gods require something from you. Not only that, but all the different types of like self-help organizations and stuff like that, they all want something from you. They want you to buy into their program and buy into their different books and buy into their tapes and their seminars and all this stuff. They're looking to get something from you before they ever give anything to you. Quite the contrary when we talk about Jesus, isn't it? Jesus has something for you. So different than any other system in the world. Jesus has something for you. Now, you may ask, what is it that Jesus has for me? Take a look at verse 6. It tells us that Jesus has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. Now, let's speak for a moment about the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant. The old covenant is inferior to the new covenant. New covenant's superior. Does that mean that the old covenant was bad? No. It doesn't mean that it was bad, it's just inferior. The old covenant was actually quite good. It was a great blessing to the people. Consider the, the old covenant. People were in slavery, bondage of slavery, for 400 years. No, no days off not able to possess things, no rights as a human being. And all of a sudden, God takes his people out of that bondage, leads them out into the wilderness, and there on Mount Sinai, he creates a covenant with the people. And what did he do in this covenant? He all of a sudden, by creating laws that this nation was going to have to live by, in creating those laws, gave rights to the people. He gave rights to the people to have a day off. He gave rights to the people to have a wife that no other man can come and take. He had rights now as an as a individual to have a household with possessions that they were able to have and nobody else was allowed to come and steal from them. So if you think about these, these laws that God put in place, some people think they're an encumbrance, but really they were quite freeing to the people. They were a blessing to the people who first received it. When man got involved, they started making it a very burden on the people. But as God gave it, it was a blessing. And so with that, the, the problem with that was it was works-based. When I say it's works-based, what I mean is 
It, it was based upon how well the individual was able to keep up with it. Here, here's why. Exodus chapter 19, verse 5. It says this. Now, if you... So this puts, this puts the onus on the individual. If you obey me and keep my covenant, you will be my own special treasure from among all the peoples on earth. So if... You, if you're able to keep the law, if you're able to do what I say, if you're able to live a life that's pleasing to me, then you're going to be this special people. So you can see how that, that makes the pressure, it puts the pressure on the person to uphold those things. But again, this was, this was a blessing to the people to have this. But God saw that, that in this, there was a need for a new covenant. This new covenant is a covenant of grace. It's a covenant where God says, I'm going to give to you something that you don't deserve. I'm going to give to you something you haven't earned. You haven't worked for it. You don't merit it. It's simply because I want to bless you. And so in this, what you see is a whole lot of God saying, I will, instead of if you. Notice verse 7. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Let's pause there for just a moment. If the first covenant had been flawless, in other words, there, there was fault in that first covenant. Now, who was the fault with? It was with people, right? The fault wasn't with God because God perfectly upheld his end of the bargain. It was people that, that God was finding fault with. So notice he says, because finding fault with them, he says in verse 8, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will there's that, that term, God saying, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant. And I disregarded them, says the Lord. For, verse 10, this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor, and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. For again, I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds. I will remember no more. This is a new covenant that God is making with humankind. He's saying, look, I'm going to take care of you. You can't live up to my standards. You're going to try, and I want you to try, and it's an important thing in your life that you try because the benefits of doing God's will is so great in your life. But he says, look, I know as hard as you try, you're going to mess up. And so I will be merciful. I will cover your sins. I will remove them so you are able to stand righteous in heaven. God's saying that he will, and not only that, because that speaks to life eternal when God says, I'm going to do those things. But another part of this covenant is he's saying, I will send you my spirit. That was the final thing as God is preparing his people. He says, look, it's not over until I send my, my spirit. And then you know Everything started. The church has begun. You're going to have my spirit. You're going to be born again. And with that comes love and joy and peace and kindness and patience and gentleness and self-control. Those things that we don't have apart from God. Right? And wisdom, strength, all these things, power, these things that we need to live life. When we're asking the questions, how am I going to live this life out? How am I going to survive? How am I going to make it through this next issue I'm going through? God says, look, I'm the, I've made a new covenant with you. You don't have to do this alone. God becomes so real, relevant to us in these times. Now, he says in verse 13, in that he says a new covenant. He, may, he has made the first obsolete now, what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. What's he talking about here? That what, what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. 
the old covenant carried with it this need for sacrifice, this need for perpetual sacrifice, right? There at the temple, people would go and the high priest would make atonement, sacrifice on the altar at the temple over and over and over again. He says, look, this old way of doing things, this old covenant, it's become obsolete and it's passing away. And prophetically, what the author of Hebrews is telling the readers is, you're holding on to your Judaism. You're holding on to your old way of doing things. You're holding on to something that doesn't work anymore. You're holding on to something that's obsolete. And, and listen, you've got to let that go because their day is coming where it's going to vanish away. And guess what? 70 AD, the temple was destroyed. It, Roman soldiers came and just destroyed it. Gone. Done. And now those, those sacrifices... Just like the author was saying, we're going to stop, it stopped. Now today, you and me as believers, we anticipate the rebuilding of this third temple, and and Jews today, same thing, they're, they're waiting for this temple to be rebuilt. But the fact is, that old way of doing things was gone. Jesus is now the most relevant thing in their lives, and He's the most relevant thing in ours. Listen, There's all sorts of issues we deal with in life. All sorts of issues. There's political issues. If you're anything like me, you're paying attention to the modern day politics. I hope you start paying attention to it so you know what's going on. But one thing I've seen is people are picking one side or another and they're they're hoping and and trusting and putting all this this anticipation in and who's going to be the next president. Listen, when it comes to politics, the most relevant person is Jesus. That's it. Now, I hate to break it to you Hillary fans. I'll get to you Trump guys in a second. (laughs) I, I hate to break it to you, but Hillary is not going to solve this nation's problems. Okay? Now, I I know you Trump people are like, yeah, but let me tell you something. Trump is not going to solve this nation's problems. The only one that can solve this nation's problems is Jesus Christ. That's it. We read in 2 Chronicles 7.14, something so important for us to think of this morning. It says, then, if my people, are you God's people? Okay, if my people who are called by my name, are you Christians? Are you called by the name of Christ? You're Christians? That's, that's what we're known as. We are Christ followers. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will. There's God again. I will. I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and restore their land. Oh, I want America to be a restored land so bad. Now, can God use whoever becomes president? Absolutely. God has used evil people since Adam. That's all he has to work with. Okay? But think about it. God has used some very evil people throughout the world. Look at Nero. Oh my gosh, if you study what Nero did, he used to take Christians and put coats of wax on them and set them on fire as candles in his garden. Okay? Wicked, evil man. Take a look at people like Hitler. Evil, rotten to the core, right? But God used him. You're like, whoa, 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 pastor just said that God used Hitler. Absolutely, God used Hitler. How do I know this? Because before then, what happened with the Jewish people? Where were they? They were all over the place. Where were they afterwards? Israel. All of a sudden, now they have a nation. God's using evil people even for His own work. And so you might consider like, oh gosh, whoever gets elected, I don't like them. I don't like Trump. I don't like Hillary. Well, I don't like them either. But I'll tell you what, I really, really like Jesus. And we're so concerned about who the next president's going to be. We're so concerned about all these political issues. But the thing we need to be concerned with is bringing people to the most relevant solution to their problems. 
And it's not either of those two people. It's Jesus Christ, plain and simple. We have not only political issues, but we have social issues. I'll just throw out the most recent social issue we're dealing with right now. Look at the gay nightclub that got shot up in Orlando. If you haven't heard about it, all you have to do is turn on the news. It's everywhere. Go on Facebook. Go on whatever. It's everywhere. Okay? Um, over 100 people shot. Over 50, I haven't heard the most recent death toll, but over 50, right? Death, people died. This was an Islamic terrorist shooting up a gay nightclub. Why? Because that is Islam's solution to homosexuality. Don't be fooled. That is Islam's solution to homosexuality. Kill them. They're gay? Kill them. Travel all around the world. Let me tell you something. You go to places like this, to Afghanistan, Iran, Nigeria, Saudi Arabia, Kenya, Yemen, United Arab Emirates. You start going to places where Islam is the religion that rules there. In all those places, homosexuality is punishable by death. They throw you off a building. They drown you in a river. That's their solution to that social issue. Kill them. Quite the contrary, when we look at Jesus Christ, his solution to social issues. He dealt with social issues of his day. People involved in sexual immorality. He dealt with people like that. How did he deal with them? Did he put them in a room and shoot them? No. Let me tell you something. This whole issue, over there's not a gun problem. This is a people problem. Something wrong with people. They need Jesus. That's the problem here. They don't, they don't even realize it, but they need Jesus. But when Jesus walked into a room, people that were sinners, they flocked to him. They couldn't wait to be with him, just to touch the hem of his garment, just to be around his presence. He didn't make them feel terrible. He made them feel loved. It was his kindness that led people to repentance. But these social issues, you can see... When social issues are dealt with, with anything other than the mind of Christ, the spirit of Christ. If it's dealt with with anything else, the results are disgusting. We need to recognize you and I have the spirit of Jesus living within us. We have the very Holy Spirit of God, the same spirit that he walked into rooms and people flocked to him. That very same spirit dwells within us. We should have this outpouring of love that's so amazing that people want to be around us, that they can't wait. Jesus is the most relevant solution to every social issue we deal with. And not only do we have political issues and social issues, we have, let's face it, personal issues. we got a lot going on in our lives. Do we not? I know we do. Listen, I've talked to three different people this last week that were having financial trouble, personally talking to these three men. And they were saying, you know what, Pastor Tim, I'm just, I'm struggling so hard. I, I, I don't make enough money. I can't get my job to, to be steady. I keep trying to catch up, but I can't make it. And as a pastor, I'm sitting there listening to them, and I let them talk. And, and a lot of times what I'll do is I'm counseling somebody, I just let them talk. And I just, I just pay attention to what they're saying, and I'm praying as they're talking. And, and in these three cases here, this last week, I'm talking to these men, the same thing I told each and every one of them. You know what I've heard from you? I've heard you're worried. I've heard your focus is on how and why and all these things. And, and I'm telling them, listen, what I have not heard from you is how you believe that Jesus is going to take care of these needs. I haven't heard that. I haven't even heard Jesus come out of your mouth. He's the most relevant solution to your problem, and you haven't even mentioned him. You haven't even uttered the name of Jesus, and you have all this worry and all this doubt and all this insecurity and all these, you know, these personal issues that Jesus is the answer to, and you haven't even mentioned his name. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says, don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about what you're going to drink. Don't worry about what clothes you're going to put on. Don't you know that life is more than that? I take care of the flowers in the field. I take care of the birds. Don't you see that? Don't you think you're more valuable to me than a bird? Jesus says, look, I know what you have need of before you even ask. And he says, if you'll seek first the kingdom of God 
and God's righteousness. Everything you need, you're going to have. Everything. And so when it comes to these personal issues that we all have, Jesus is the most relevant solution. He reigns from a a temple in heaven that's beyond anything we can comprehend. He's not demanding things from us to gain favor with Him. And He's already done all the work. He continually says, I will, I will, I will. Don't worry, I've got this covered for you. And so today, as we know, we've got all sorts of issues in our lives, political and social and personal. Let's just give these over to the Lord today, amen? Let's pray for that freedom right now. Father, we come before you.